Welcome to a platform where we debate on the top stories of the NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, and other leagues with the best in the world of sports. You also get interviews with many athletes and media talents at several basketball events, including the WNBA and college basketball. My name is Rafiq Kuluzan, and this is Nothing But That Sports Talk. Yeah, USA really turned up as a welcome to this episode of Nothing But That Sports Talk. I'm Rafiq Kuluzan, alongside Aliyah Morisi, if I pronounce it right. Yeah, Alan Morrissey. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you for coming on the show. I know I know, the podcast is not your thing, but I, I figured why not just give it a go while you can. Yeah, yeah, this is my first time, or first podcast experience, but I was like, yeah, why not try it? Uh, good to kind of do those different experiences, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and a quick note, sometimes podcast experience can lead to on-air experience as well, if that's if you plan on doing that in the future. You might get invited mm-hmm. to test why in your post, like, like a few other WB content creators and writers, yeah, you never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen a lot of people that I follow. You know, they've you know started as writers and gone to you know content creators and you know podcast hosts. So that's been really cool. Yeah, exactly. Now let's let's get to the subject. While yeah, of course USA they literally dominated in their very last game in blowout fashion. It's Rio Nesco and and Brianna Stewart literally picked up where he left off during the first half of the season and of course the all-star break seeing that chemistry carry on into the olympics what are your thoughts yeah i mean it's been really cool to see so most of my experience has been covering the liberty um i write for the local w which is a you know local news uh local magazine that covers new york women's sports so i've been writing for the liberty or for them about the liberty for about a year um so it's been really cool just to see you know the journey of this team i've been following them since 2014, 2015, when I first started following the WNBA. So, you know, seeing, you know, the evolution of Liberty from then until now has been incredible. Um, Especially, you know, Brianna Stewart and Sabrina Ionescu in their second year together in New York. Uh, It's been so cool just seeing, you know, this chemistry, you know, not just with them, with the whole team, but now on Team USA, you know, their teammates again um, in Paris. and like you mentioned, they're picking up right where they left off. Um, Brianna Stewart has been incredible, dominant. Her and Asia Wilson have really carried this team so far, um, especially, you know, in the first, you know, the WNBA All-Star game, uh, their, uh, you know, game against Japan and their exhibition game. And Sabrina Ionescu has provided a really nice, you know, extra energy off the bench. So it's been really cool to see. And I know they're playing in about an hour um, against Belgium. So I'm really excited to kind of see that, you know, chemistry continue uh, when they take on Belgium in about an hour. Yeah, and obviously you're not going to want my thoughts on the, on the game against Belgium. You're going to have to wait until the very next episode when it gets published for those of you that are watching this episode right now. But that's besides the points. U.S. I mean, USA... This this team has been around for a while, and they've had the Oak Liberty players. And to your Charles, you, you say you've been coming to WNBA since you watch the WNBA since. Yeah, so yeah, I've, I've been a fan and of the OG team. So pretty much, you're kind of like only ten years into the game when you you working with people that have been covering WNBA since like its beginning in the '90s. So yeah, yeah. what did they tell you about the whole Liberty franchise importance to the W as a whole before we get to more USA talk? Are you talking about like what did you know the local W staff and other content creators tell me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm i pretty young. I'm only 23 years old. I graduated from college uh, in 2023, so I'm very new to this space. Um, so when I first joined, you know, I relied on, uh, you know, asking a lot of people who have been in the space for much longer, just kind of how to navigate it um, and just, you know, for their advice and also just, you know, talking about the evolution of the team. Um, so I wasn't quite, you know, around, you know, the Lobo, uh, Becky Hammond, uh, Kim Hampton, all those players type era when they first began, but I started following them when they had, you know, Tina Charles, Sugar Rogers, Essence Carson, um, you know, all that incredible team, you know, they had a few good playoff runs, uh, didn't get to a championship, but uh, that was really fun to watch. And it's been really fun to see kind of the evolution from that you know, first, you know, 90s era to the Tina Charles era. And now it's kind of, we're getting into that, you know, Brianna Stewart, Sabrina Ionescu, Benai Jelini Hamilton area. So it's been fun to see kind of the evolution of the team in those kind of three parts. Yeah, and keep in mind though, this USA team, they they literally spent f- three years, which is the shortest span between the last Olympics and this year's compared to other Olympics 
when you got that that usual four years in which we'll get back to that because after this year, the next Olympics will be in 2028 down in LA, but that's besides the point. Seeing that this team come together in a short period of time or, or in that period of time span, like Sabri Onescu, you think her game along with Brianna Stewart's game is going to evolve as you get to the second half of the season? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you're just, I mean, you're seeing it real time now with the Olympics, you know, I'm obviously they're taking on different roles. Obviously Sabrina's not coming off the bench for the Liberty um, and Brianna Stewart doesn't have to carry, you know, such a heavy load with the Liberty this season, which has been great to see, but you kind of see their games evolving in real time as they're playing with some of the, you know, best, you know, players in the W and players in the league uh, with this Team USA team. I've been loving kind of the tandem duo of Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart, you know, on this team that's really their, it's Team USA is really their team now. Um, you know, Diana Tarazi is obviously, you know, that senior leader on it, but they've really been dominant, um, you know, the entire time we've seen this Team USA team together. Um, and I know Sabrina Unescu is a first time Olympian, so there's, we haven't gotten to see too much of her. Um, uh, she said, but when she's come in, she's provided really good minutes and, you know, just continue to do what she has done in this, uh, you know, incredible season that she's having probably the best season of her WNBA career so far. Yeah, exactly. And she's going to need more than that because, well, obviously Germany won earlier today, which means if USA were to pull off a win against Belgium, they'll automatically be in the quarterfinals. Which yeah. is no surprise because you, you're talking about 12 of the best basketball players in the world. Too bad Kayla Clark couldn't make the roster. But that's besides the point. You talk about the best basketball players in America working their way towards being the best basketball players in the world. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and I, I mean, the the stats to, to, to back that up are incredible. You know, they haven't won anything less than gold since 1992. They won... I believe it's like 50 straight, 56 straight Olympic games. Now, you know, this team is incredibly dominant as always. I don't think there's anybody that's going to pose, you know, an incredibly real threat to, you know, them hoisting that eighth consecutive gold medal. Um, but I mean, you know, they've had some challenges, especially playing, you know, that WNBA all-star team, uh, they lost again to them. Um, but I think that opened up their eyes, uh, and, you know, they've just continued to grow and evolve as a team. And, uh, you know, this team, especially there's a bunch of new, First time Olympians, there's some, you know, more senior members, and then you have Diana Tarazi in her sixth Olympics. So just kind of, you know, the age difference and the, you know, experience level is completely different, but, you know, they just seem to continue to be better at meshing well together. And when you have experienced players in the Olympics helping out the new and up and coming players uh, elevate their game in playing in qualifying tournaments and practices, that helps a lot when you go up against some of the best in the world. Like, this is the Olympics, which is way bigger than the WBA championship itself, making you, which would make you only the champion of the WNBA, not the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, and it's really cool to see because, you know, Sabrina Unesco in particular, she's always said she's looked up to Diana Tarazi, who is the most senior member on this team. So it's really, you know, kind of cool to see, you know, those learning and mentorship movements or mentorship, you know, opportunities on the court that we've even seen so far, you know, players coaching up each other, you know, telling them where they want to be, the team huddling after, you know, every point or every, uh, during the game. So it's been really fun to see just kind of, you know, the camaraderie of this team, even though they play in all different W teams, um, they come together for the Olympics because they want to win and they always want to win gold. Exactly. It's all about winning uh, getting the hardware. And you showed it as they actually had a 102 to 76 victory over Japan earlier this week. And they, they showed because of good ball movement, they know how to space the floor, they know how to score in transition. So Bill Nesku carries the team on transition, when, especially when you pass it to, to taller players like Brianna Stewart or, or Asia Wilson. And also they know how to knock down three-point shots to the baseline in the, in the, in the top of the key. That, that's something that they're going to need in order to pull off a victory against Belgium today. Yeah, I mean, just looking forward to the game against Belgium, it's going to be different. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, when they play Japan, they obviously had the, you know, size and height advantage. So they use that a lot in the matchup. But, you know, looking to this Belgium team, they have a lot more size than Japan had. And they had they have some W stars like former, you know, player Emma Mieseman and then, you know, the Mystics rookie Julie Van Loo. So it's going to take, you know, a different set of matchups um, and, you know, 
Cheryl Reeve has, you know, obviously been working on that, but it's going to take, you know, different players each time, you know, it's not going to be the same player pulling off the hero ball every time, you know, it's sharing the ball around. Um, and so it's going to be interesting just to see, you know, what the matchups are going to be in this game compared to what they were, you know, in the exhibition game and in the Japan game. So I'm excited to see, you know, what Coach Reeve, you know, rolls out for this game against Belgium. Yeah, and you know what? What well, I should be worried about USA. They barely, I mean, aside, outside of the Olympics, they barely had too many blow up. They barely lose games, which is what mm-hmm. you love to see. It all because you have the top players. It's also highlighted by Dan Tarazi, who's looking to surpass her former Olympian teammate, Sue Bird, yep. for most gold medals in the USA roster. And if they pull this off and Diane Tarazi get that goal, what would that mean for her as her career comes to a close? Yeah, I mean, I know like a lot of reporters have asked her, you know, questions about where she sees, you know, her WNBA career going past this year. Um, I already know she's kind of announced that she's not planning to obviously play in LA for the 2028 Olympics, but I think this would just kind of be the icing off on the cake for just an incredible historic, you know, GOAT career. Um, Six Olympics is really unheard of, you know, just in the sport of basketball, but then, you know, in any Olympic sport. Um, And she's kind of just been this leader the entire way. Uh, You know, obviously she doesn't have to carry the team as much as she had to to in previous Olympics, but just her leadership um, for this team this year has been incredible to see. We even saw after she, uh, Team USA lost the WME All-Star game and she kind of pulled everyone to the huddle and she was the first to speak. Um, And I think that leadership is just such a testament to, you know, how much the other players respect her and how much she means to this Team USA team, you know, uh, not just on the court, but also off the court. So it's been, you know, really cool to see. Yeah, whether you're doing a lot of scoring or, or you do less scoring, but a lot more passing, being the facilitator on the offense, like Chelsea Grace was doing when she had 13 assists. Yeah. Well, she only had two points, but the 13 assists, that produces a lot of offensive production for the USA women's basketball team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the coolest thing about this team is just, you know, each player has their own strengths. Like you mentioned, Chelsea Gray, you know, she doesn't need to be, you know, a huge scorer for Team USA because she has that court vision and she has, you know, those passing skills that are going to come through. And she's just, you know, one of the best at finding people in transition and in the offense. So, you know, players are sticking to what their strengths are for this team and they're not having to do too much. Um, You know, Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart are, you know, the – I guess would say the main scores for this team, but every player, you know, has their own strengths and in, in each different matchup, they're able to take advantage of that. Um, so it's been cool to see, you know, the players outside of the W, they don't have to, you know, do as much as they usually are counted on just because it's, you know, the 12 best players in the world um, and each have just kind of played to their, you know, their own strengths uh, at the Olympics. Yes. There's going to be, a, well, it may not look like it, but winning games in the Olympics is tough. Mm-hmm. I've had winning anything is tough in life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been watching all the other like games in group play. Um, France looks really tough. Uh, who else? Uh, you know, Australia had a rough go in the in the first game, but they yeah, you know, found... mean, yeah, Australia they, they, they kind of had a rough go at the beginning, but obviously they're gonna get it together. You're being carried by Sandy Brandello, and then of course the other little replays from Germany, Mayora mm-hmm. Sapoli, she's doing well for Germany. So um, what 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 do you I mean? Let, let's let's just on that subject. I mean, you have at least a few Liberty players playing for three different Olympic roster. Would you be happy about USA winning gold or or any New York Liberty winning gold for the other international teams in the Olympics? <laughs> I mean, obviously, I would. You know, I think USA is going to take home the gold. You know, I I hope they do. You know, I'm rooting for them mostly, but it's also. It's also cool to see, you know, I hope Australia does well just for, you know, Coach Sandy Brondell for the Liberty. Um, You know, I hope she comes away with it with, you know, some accolades and, you know, great experience. Um, And then I, you know, whenever I watch the Germany games, I'm always rooting rooting for like Leonie Fibich and uh, Niara Sable. You know, I want them to do well. Do I want their teams to do well? Not so much as as long as the USA wins, but it's been cool to see, you know, all these players um, playing for their respective, you know, countries and international teams and, you know, lighting it up regardless of the minutes they get in the WNBA. They're kind of the stars in their own international team. So that's been fun. Yeah, it's been fun indeed. And obviously, well, as you continue to cover the WNBA for as long as you can, 
you're going to see more growth with, with the USA rosters and the Liberty players going forward. And now, once the Olympics ends, we have the second half of the WNBA season with the New York Liberty. They're 21-4 and four going to Olympic break, which is the fewest loss they've had going into the, the All-Star break, or Olympic break, rather. I mean, do you, they're going to tip off the second half with two straight games against the Dallas Wings and the Connecticut Sun. Do you think that the Liberty could continue to build off of what they had last month or last last month or so? Oh yeah, I mean, praying then hopefully there's no, you know, in, you know, regardless of, I just, I think the main thing going into the second half of the season is, you know, the team's health. Um, uh, Benajah Laney Hamilton, I know she was out for the, that last few games to end the first half of the regular season, she had a knee surgery um, and she's recovering now. Uh, I know Niara Sabli just went down in Germany's last game. So hoping, uh, you know, everything with that is okay. So I think the team's health is, and, you know, uh, I think that's going to be the most important thing. Um, and just, you know, coming off the Olympics, you know, Sabrina and Brianna, I hope they're, you know, they get some rest even after the Olympics and they're not, you know, too tired and just ready to gear up for the second half of the season. But I definitely think they can continue that momentum that they had in the first half. Um, I think they're going to get everyone back. They're going to continue to figure out rotations. Um, they're going to have some time to practice before games tip off. And uh, looking at the first half of the season compared to the second, they don't have as many tough games. I know that they play the Aces twice, uh, the Sun once more, uh, the Storm twice. But I believe when I was doing my There's research... Yeah, Minnesota Lynx once. Um, I believe only seven or eight of their game, last 15 games are against teams that are currently in the playoff picture. Um, but I think the most important thing is just, uh, you know, playing those teams hard, but then also playing the teams who are not in the playoff picture hard because they got to learn how to, you know, guard against that complacency and not get too, you know, lax and easy um, with those games against teams who they can probably easily beat. But, you know, they just want to continue to grow each game. So it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, of course, four of the losses came against, came against teams that are currently in the top eight. Indiana, mm -hmm. Chicago, Minnesota, and Phoenix. So, yeah. do you, I mean, with the, going to the playoffs, if they end up running to these playoffs, which of the four teams that they did lose to will be a tough will be a tough matchup for New York Liberty if the playoffs were to start right now? I mean, if I was a team, I wouldn't want to face the the Lynx again. Um, every time we played them in the first half of the season, uh, it's been a, you know, it's been a tough matchup. And the Liberty lost the Commissioner's Cup final to the Minnesota Lynx, um, uh, you know, which is a tough loss. They weren't able to uh, uh, get their second straight Commissioner's Cup title. But they also showed their ability to bounce back because a week later, the two teams played again. Um, and the Liberty ended up winning and cut down a lot of the mistakes that they had in the final. So... Um, but Minnesota's tough, you know, Collier's health is a big thing, uh, but now she's playing the Olympics. So hopefully everything's good with that. Um, so she's, you know, an MVP candidate uh, and they just have a lot of depth and they have a lot of good three point shooters and their defense is really tough. So if I was a Liberty, obviously I, you know, I wouldn't like to play the Lynx, you know, first, second round, depending on where standings end up. Uh, but I think just you know, I think the Liberty can be anyone in this league. It's just a matter of cutting down on those mistakes, uh, continuing to establish that chemistry and not uh, just not let their guard down and, you know, take every game that they're going to play uh, for the second half of the season uh, as hard as they would take the last. Yeah, and you can tell by the four losses they did have when they, when it, I mean, they were trailed by as many as like 17 to begin the game. They look, the body language looks a little bit slow. They, could, they couldn't they knock down their shots. They had a tough time stopping anybody. I mean, and, and yeah, they'll get they get to get a third quarter, but but all the momentum that they've had in the third quarter kind of like slows down a lot. Yeah. And, or either that or they get off to a strong start or they and they kind of slow down a little bit. It's all because somehow the star players from the opposing team gets hot. Like look at the loss in the end the last time. They, mm -hmm. they they start off slow, they came back, had like a 12-point lead, but they came the clock started picking up some self-esteem and get, getting her first career triple-double against the Oak Liberty. So, with that being said, obviously, Kayla Clark and Angel Reese, both of them are duking out for the final spot or to stay into the top eight, could potentially face the Oak Liberty. And that's that, sure. talking about a high-rate matchup between the runner-up in last year's WMA finals between those and either the number one pick in the draft or 
a team that or a player that isn't necessarily a top three pick, but is literally still a hot ticket nonetheless is Angel Reese. So which one of these players do you want to face in round one? Or you think they make a great most televised playoff series, New Liberty versus Chicago Sky or Liberty versus the Fever? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. And it's it's tough because the Liberty have both beaten and lost to both of these teams in the first half of the season. Um so uh, I mean, granted the Liberty, hopefully, you know, still get that number one seed. Um, but I think that's a tough matchup. Uh, both teams are, you know, really tough. And I think it's really interesting to see how Chicago will look now that they just trade a, traded away, the, you know, their best three-point shooter in Marina B Mabry. Um, and so they have a lot new, a lot of new pieces and a lot of new, you know, things they need to integrate. So I, I don't really know how that team's going to look coming out in the second half of the season. Um, but I also think Indiana is incredibly scary right now because, you know, they had that really rough stretch to start the season. Uh, but now they kind of caught fire and, uh, you know, they were one of the scarier teams to watch in that latter half of the se first half of the season. Um, and as they continue to kind of build that chemistry and, you know, Caitlin Clark and Aaliyah Boston continue to, you know, build that chemistry on the court, they're going to be, I think if they make the playoffs, they're going to pose a real threat to, you know, any team they play. So um, if I were the Liberty, I'd hope just to get that number one seed um, and, you know, I don't think there's a matchup that they would fear or want. I think both both teams would be, you know, a tough matchup and they just have to, you know, continue to play the way that they played in the regular season uh, and not take any teams too easy because any team can win in this league. Uh, that's what we've seen in the first half of the season. So any team, you know, you got it's dangerous and, you know, you got to play, play your best against. Yeah, it's going to be tough for no matter who they face because, look, even though Connecticut, even though Liberty has slept on Connecticut, so Connecticut the last two seasons, let's not forget Connecticut did get that one game it's just game one in the second round, which I just think it okay to live here in danger, but they but they eventually they picked it up and they they it seems like Connecticut they're always a tough out when you're facing them on the road or when yeah. you're in general. I mean, they had to scratch and claw to get those wins against the Connecticut Sun, and that's mm -hmm. just surely gonna be a tough team. And imagine a scratching claw, they're gonna have to do now that Marina Mayberry is there, she can shoot, if she, she can shoot the NBA as long as I have, which is in 2020, you know. What type of offense production Maria Mayberry can do? Yeah, and I mean, the one thing that Connecticut was kind of lacking was that three-point shooting, um, and that's exactly what they also recognize, and that's why they got they went out and got got her uh, from the sky. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how she kind of integrates into that team, and you know what they're able to do with that. Obviously, I don't think she's she'll probably come off the bench because they kind of have that solidified starting five. Uh, but they obviously, you know, saw a need and addressed it. Um, and now they have some time to, you know, practice. Uh, it's good that they have that they have this break now. So it's going to be really interesting to see. I I still would never count out the sun. They've been great for years. Um, it's so it's it's going to be interesting to see whether they can get over that hump and, you know, beat the Liberty, the Aces, the Lynx, uh, those types of teams to uh, try to make a finals run. Yeah. And don't forget, you have the Las Vegas Aces to contend with. The team that, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you was at the WBA finals last year, you know how close they were to winning the championship, or at least for say game five and game four. I was there for game three and four, it was heartbreaking. Yeah, me too. I, I, I was actually like, I went to both of those games as a fan. I actually took my parents to both of those games, and game three was great. They got the Liberty got the win, but then game four was really tough because you know the Aces didn't have Chelsea Gray. You know, I, I think a lot of fans thought, oh, you know, she's kind of the heart of this team. You know, the Liberty should be able to get this win. Uh, but then their bench play, the Aces bench players came in and had an incredible game. Um, and you know they they went they got away with it. So that was a, that was a rough night in New York. But uh, uh, hopefully hopefully it'd be different uh, this this time around. Yeah, exactly. I mean, was that your first time you've been to the finals or you've been to the finals before? Uh, I mean, no. So I, I, I'm from Connecticut right now. So I, uh, um, that was my first ever, you know, in-person finals experience. Um, and obviously the Liberty hadn't made a final since, you know, 2002, I think. Um, so that was my first time, you know, being in person for a finals. And the atmosphere was absolutely incredible. You know, it was unlike anything, any other sporting event I've been to. So it was a really awesome experience. Yeah, and, and for you, and for those of you that didn't know, including you, I've been covered, I've covered the WWE finals since twenty twenty, so nice. but it's all been virtual up until last year, or, up yeah, until last year, and those are the big ones because you know it's Brooklyn. 
And you, you see, I'm glad you got to experience the fans waving the towel. It's, it's oh yeah, you know, hold on to for as long as you live. Definitely, and I mean, I've been around since kind of a fan since the Madison Square Garden days. Um, and then when the team had to go to Westchester County Arena uh, for two, three years, and that was a really rough experience. Mm -hmm. cause less than you know, two thousand fans. You know, it. I mean, it was a good experience. Good you know, cheap tickets to get seats, but uh, it wasn't yeah, what a professional... Yeah, except they weren't that good. They The team was not get that good either. The seats, the whole arena wasn't great, and it's just not what a professional team deserves. So to now have them at Barclays, you know, it's attendance records, energy is incredible. Um, just the whole, you know, in-game experience has been completely elevated from, like, years ago, and it's just, you know, it's so fun to go to games, whether you're a basketball fan or not, so... Uh, for anyone out there, you know, highly, highly recommend just going to any WNBA game, any WNBA game, wherever you're located. It's, it's really a special time. Exactly. You say, you know, you say you currently live in Connecticut. You can go to guy Connecticut Sun game. Matter of fact, you can come to New York Liberty. Well, well, oh man, they played all the, oh yeah, they played all the games in Connecticut already for the season. Yeah, I think they have one more game uh, in New York. They were in the playoffs then. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Oh, I think you cut out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm saying like, um, well, unless they run into each other in the playoffs again, then yeah, you can probably come to every person. Well, wow. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm like two hours from Mohegan Sun, so and like 45 minutes from New York Liberty. So when I was kind of choosing a team to root for, I kind of went with the team closer to me. But uh, yeah, I, I've been to Mohegan Sun a couple times. I uh, haven't covered a game there, but I uh, would love to at some point uh, down the road. Yeah, don't worry. You'll make it happen as long as you continue working on your writing skills and, and making sure that your vocabulary is intact and try to make sure that whenever you, you do it, you write everything right so you save the editor a lot less editing to do when you send it to the yeah. editor. That's pretty much all I'm going to say. Yeah, well, I appreciate that advice. Yeah, I'm really new to this space um, and, you know, trying to just continue to grow my portfolio and like following and uh, uh, not exactly sure where I see myself, you know, going in this space, but kind of just taking it as it comes. So I appreciate, you know, talking to anybody who's been in the space for longer and has any advice. So I appreciate that. Yeah, exactly. Well, that concludes this episode of Nothing But That Sports. So thank you for stopping by. See, not bad for your first podcast episode on the air. Great experience. Thanks so much, Rafiq. Appreciate you having me on. It was great. For Rafiq Luzon, Aaliyah, we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks so much.